Uh, before we go to the Word of God this morning, let's just bow our heads together. Our Father, as we come to your Word now this morning, we pray that you would please just open it up for us to see where we are in our personal lives and where you are in our world and in our life and how you want to put us together uh, in a way that really helps us move forward for you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're going to be looking at what has to be certainly the most familiar of all the Psalms and probably the most familiar of all the verses in the Bible, perhaps with ex the exception of the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 23. Uh, in order to um, uh, get ourselves started this morning, I'd like to ask that we might stand together and let's uh, read the psalm or recite it, however you choose to do it, uh, together. Uh, and remember, this is a prayer that the Lord has given to us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated. In California, Sierra Nevada mountains, it's supposed to snow a whole lot. Uh, the words Sierra Nevada means snowy range. And a look at the record book will tell you why. Uh, the Sierra Nevadas, California's mountains, have the have a highest one-day snowfall of 67 inches, which is a second highest of, of anything in the United States. 67 inches, that's over five feet of snow in one day. The highest single storm, second in the United States, of, of 15 feet is six inches. That's not one day, but that's one storm, 15 feet of snow. And Buffalo might be saying, yeah, you think that's a lot? But no, it's... Highest month snowfall is 32 feet, 5 inches. That's a month. Now, just to put that in perspective, from the floor to that little top of the ceiling there is 28 feet. And the highest total winter snowfall, 73 feet, 7 inches. So that'd be higher by 20 feet than the uh, top of the, um, uh, of the building here, top of the, of, the pulp, of the steeple. But this past winter... None of that happened. By spring, the snowpack was 5% of what it was supposed to be. And on April 2nd, as you probably saw in the news, Governor Jerry Brown stood on bare ground where there were supposed to be five feet of snow that, at that particular day. And he had to announce the most severe water restrictions in California history. As you probably know, all of that snow, tens and 20 feet and 30 feet, whatever it is, of snow sitting at high elevation uh, acts as a reservoir and as that snow melts throughout the summer, then it fills uh, the various lakes, reservoirs, and rivers, and eventually becomes the drinking water and irrigation water for the whole state of California. Uh, you and I have probably been eating, actually eating plants with that water in it uh, for the, all of our lives, as all of those uh, vegetables and fruits and so on come out of uh, the valley, the Sacramento Valley and so on. But this year, no snow, and that means no water. The reservoirs were already disastrously low. I love that picture. Isn't that great? July 20th, 2011, January 16th, 2014. Same place. Yeah. Don't think we're going for a picnic there. No snow in the mountains. They're not going to be refilled this year. So millions of Californians were beginning to come to terms with what it means to live in the desert. Of course, they always had lived in a semi-desert but they just didn't have to live like it as long as there was plenty of water being piped into their homes to water their lawns or to grow things. But now they're facing the reality that there's not going to be water for this summer. The Bible tells us the story of God and His rescue of His creation, including you and me. Most of all, it's a story of how He rescues and restores human beings. And at the very heart of that story is the great journey from slavery to freedom called the Exodus. If you really want to understand your Bible, you know, and if you're a kind of person who writes in your Bible or writes in the flyleaf, you could just write in the front of it, Exodus. 
Because that's the story that comes up over and over and over again throughout the entire Bible. It's a story of a long trek through the desert. If you look at a, even a satellite or a space uh, station picture, if we look at the next slide, of the Sinai Peninsula, over on the left is the Nile River where it fans out. That's all green and lush to this day. Over on the right, another sort of dark place up near the top is Israel with the uh, Sea of Galilee up there, or the Dead Sea that would be. And in between is the Sinai Peninsula where the Exodus happened. And guess what? There's no McDonald's in the Exodus. There are no roads. There were no roads in the Exodus except maybe one up by the, by the Mediterranean that was used by the Egyptian military. They were in a place where there were no towns, no cities, no water, no rivers. A place where you might find a little desert spring here and there, but a desert journey all the way. Mountains, ravines, sand, rock called the Sinai Desert. Imagine what it must have been like to leave the garden setting of, of Egypt, living there by the Nile, where the river flowed all year long and where in the spring it would, uh, it would, its banks would rise up and it would flood vast areas, replenishing the soil. Uh, the the uh, Egyptians had created canal systems for irrigating. They, this place was the breadbasket of the entire Mediterranean world, even up to the time of Jesus. This is where they grew all the wheat and all the ships would go back and forth to keep the rest of the empire fed. This was the garden of the entire Mediterranean. Imagine leaving that behind and you're going to go to a place called the land flowing with milk and honey. Well, that sounds great, but in between you're going to spend 40 days in the desert. No markets, no towns, no gardens, no pastures. The next oasis might be days away. And how would you know which way to go? There were no road signs. In fact, there were no roads. No wonder the wandering Israelites were so prone to fear and grumbling. I suppose you and I would have been too. But they were not alone. Every step of the way over that 40 years, God went before them. Every day, He provided for their needs. If you read the Exodus story, it's a story of miracles in a desert, of food that miraculously appears and continues to appear, the manna of quail, the birds that fly in. We know there were migratory routes where the birds did fly over that area, but God called them in at the time of His choosing and fed His people. Water from the rock, these desert springs, God opened them up for, for the Israelites so that they never lacked. Must have seemed a journey that seemed like aimless wandering and mere survival turned out to be a journey that God was orchestrating from the old to the new, from slavery to freedom, from death to life. It's the Exodus journey. Now, in announcing these draconian water restrictions for Californians, Governor Brown warned that the drought was very likely the new normal. You've probably heard that term a number of times, the new normal. Get used to it. As far as he could tell, the desert was back and it's going to be around for a while. You might be feeling in your own life or in the life of a friend or a loved one that Somehow things have changed so that you're no longer in that lush garden place. You're not where you want to be. You're somewhere in between in, in a desert experience. Somebody turned off the water. The, the snows didn't fall at the high elevations. And the things you could count on aren't going to happen this year. Imagine being a Californian who just bought a brand new lawnmower. <laughs> Honey, what do we buy that thing for? Hey, we're going to have a brown lawn or we're going to put in carpet. Uh, imagine that new normal. You may be feeling like that. Maybe looking at your life and saying, I've struggled and worked to get to this point in my life, and now all of a sudden a whole lot of things I was counting on aren't there anymore. Uh, it may be that you're, you're looking at the future and you're saying, I don't think I have what it takes for this next step of life. Moms, you have been there uh, when you know what it's like to walk out into the unknown. Obviously, uh, just the very fact of discovering that you're pregnant and then putting together those nine months of everything changing and in many ways not really being in control of the situation, right down to the day that the baby comes, and perhaps even that then was a surprise. We've heard some great stories here and even in our church family of babies that wanted to come faster than mom could get to the hospital. And that was just the beginning. Then life really took off. 
And uh, there have to be times when we, we look at that as moms and dads, as, as individuals in our society, and we look at our lives and we go, is this the way it's supposed to be? We start to realize this is a new normal, that we're not going to get back to what we had before. Uh, Pastor Rob mentioned last week that life changed when you got married. Now, he and I went back to singlehood on Monday night, right, and Tuesday night. I paid for it the whole rest of the week. You were fine, right? Yeah, we watched NBA basketball. Of course, they had to be West Coast games. He's a West Coast guy. So the games got done at what time? One o'clock or? Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, it was great. And I learned more basketball sitting with Pastor Rob than I have learned in my entire life. But unfortunately, I came home to my old normal, which is I didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> you got him back. Have you got him back in shape yet? That's the real question. Yeah, she's got, yeah. <laughs> New normal. When we are wondering whether our world's out of control, when we're wondering how it's all going to fit, what are we going to do when the kid leaves home? What are we going to do if the kid doesn't leave home? What, what are we going to do with another mouth to feed? What are we going to do when this job is finished? What are we going to do with mom when mom is now needing our help just as much as the kids that we're taking care of or dad uh, or other family members? How do we handle this new normal? It's at times like this that God's word shouts loud and clear that he, not the desert, is our new normal. If you get one thing from this message, that's what I want you to get. He is your new normal, not your circumstance, not the stuff that's going on. Whether it's really great right now or whether it's, you're feeling like things are in a, in a kind of a stalled out uh, situation or even where you're wondering how you're going to get through the next day, week, or month, or year, God is the new normal. He's calling us to a journey through the desert to the new life he has for us. He, we're invited to be on his exodus journey. Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm, is a song about the new normal of that journey. And the first thing I want you to see, the first new normal is you're not alone. You're not on your own. What is, how does the psalm begin? The Lord is my shepherd. Now, it was very common in the, in the Hebrew Bible, in the, the Jewish scriptures, to speak of the Lord as shepherd. And when the, the, the writers spoke of the Lord as shepherd, they were usually thinking in terms of the Exodus because God had brought his people out. Psalm 80, verse 1, begins with these words, Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. And the psalm goes on, as do several other ones, to describe God as a shepherd bringing his people out of slavery into freedom. But there's a change in Psalm 23. It's not you're the shepherd of Israel, although that is certainly true. But now David says the Lord is my shepherd. The God who created the heavens and the earth is my personal shepherd in my desert journey. The Lord is my shepherd. The desert may be empty and trackless, not a path showing on it, not even a footprint in front of us to see where we're going. The journey may be dangerous and seem, seem to be without any purpose, but the shepherd knows what he's doing. He's my shepherd. That alone tells me God knows where I'm going. Ask me where I'm going, I don't know. I don't know what the next thing is. You don't know. None of us could know. I have a few plans. I have a few ideas. I have seen my plans and my ideas blow up so many times that I hold them somewhat lightly. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. So isn't it good to know that somebody's in charge? Remember going when you were a little kid, you go on a vacation and you're sitting there in the back seat and dad or mom is driving and all you had to do was pester them with those infamous words, are we there yet? Because why did you bother to ask them? Because you don't know where we're going, but they do, or they're supposed to. <laughs> of course, they have to come up with all sorts of gimmicks to keep us from realizing, yeah, it's only seven more hours. <laughs> Just sort of like a universe for a little kid. But we know, mom knows, dad knows where we're going. The Lord is my shepherd. The second new normal is our needs are provided in the desert. Now think about that. You're not alone. You're not alone on this new normal. It'll feel like it, but you're not alone. And number two, you're going to feel needy, 
Because the needs are all around you. That's what desert means. But your needs are going to be provided. Think about what isn't available in a desert. First of all, water. The definition of a desert is that any water that shows up is more than taken away by evaporation. 30% of the world is desert. Uh, now, some of it is desert that you and I don't think of as desert. No cactuses. Antarctica is one giant desert. But even so, other places, vast areas of the planet are desert because some rain does fall once in a while. Uh, usually they say a desert has to get something like 10 inches or less per year. But the problem is the 10 inches goes away. It does, there's no way for it to stick around. No food, no water, no food, no path. You get out in a real desert and there is nothing to show you where you've been or where you're going. But when the shepherd leads us, he meets all of our needs. We read in Deuteronomy 2.7, a summary by Moses of the Exodus journey. This is the chance to go to the end of the journey. Say, well, how did it all turn out? You know, we start in Exodus, and we got those 40 years, and we're reading through all those various stories. And, and then we get to uh, jump to the end, Ex uh, Deuteronomy 2.7. And Moses reminds the people, the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through the vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked anything. Now, the word lack is exactly the same verb that is used in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I do not lack anything. And commentators connect the dots here and say, well, the 23rd Psalm is about your personal Exodus journey, saying, look how that fits in with God's Exodus journey. A journey through this vast wilderness. Have you ever been in a place where you felt like your journey was through a vast wilderness? I know I certainly have. And I've, I've been at points where I just didn't know where the next step was going to be. And if you ever lost a loved one or if you ever had a really tough diagnosis or gone through a major health problem, a major financial problem, a, a, a major relational problem, who hasn't had a few of those things or else maybe loved ones that you know and care about are going through those things. Those are like that vast wilderness. Hey, it may be great for everybody else, but man, you're under the gun. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked anything. Now take that thought and go back to the familiar words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Food for the journey. You make me lie down in green pastures. Now think about that. A green pasture in the middle of barren wastes. Not where you would expect them. Remember, this was not written for Vermont. David's experience was desert, desert, desert. Take the sheep, find a little place where there was some grass growing. God brings us to those places of provision where there is green grass to eat, if you will, where our needs are met, where we're nourished, even though all around us, it doesn't look like anything could grow. Still waters speaks to an oasis in a parched landscape, just as God provided water for his people in the Exodus story. A path through the wilderness, paths of righteousness, the right path, not just any old path, but the right path in every situation, no matter how confusing just as God led his people with the cloud and the pillar of fire in the desert. Deserts are places where people get lost, where you can get turned around, where you have no way to orient yourself. You might look and see a mirage and think, oh, if I walk that way, I'll get to some place where there's water and undoubtedly people, and you walk and you walk and you walk, and the mirage keeps jumping ahead of you, and after a while, you have no idea where you are. See. Life is just like that when we're in the middle of confusing situations. I think one of the things that we pastors, and I'm sure our elders and Bible study leaders would agree, one of the things we deal with the most is, is uh, sitting down and praying with people who are facing tough decisions, trying to figure out what to do next. Well, what's the right thing to do? Some of the things are pretty clear. In fact, frankly, frankly, most of the things we don't want to have clear are crystal clear. <laughs> but the things that we really want the answers for are sometimes pretty fuzzy. You're not alone. New normal, you're not alone. 
God's going to meet every need. He's going to give you direction, a path of rightness. Boy, if we ever needed a path of rightness in our society, it is right now. We need to become a people who think rightly, who are loving, who are courteous, who are a light for Jesus, but who think rightly, who follow a right path, even if everybody else is saying, come down a different path. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And how about protection in the darkest times? In the familiar words of the King James, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the literal phrase there, the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You see, he goes before us. Jesus has already been down that path. The good shepherd lay down his life, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, for the sheep. The valley of the shadow of death became his reality, his complete reality as he walked into that. He said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own free will, and I take it up again. And when he rose from the dead, he took that life back up again, and he comes back for you, and he comes back for me, and he says, follow me. And we go, no, 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 it's too dark, it's too scary, I don't want to go into that place. And he says, walk beside me. Let me put my arm around you. Let me carry you on my shoulders. I'll take you through that place. The song ends with a song of plenty the new normal, is that we have the victory now. We have the victory celebration, the parade, the banquet now, even though we're still going through that desert experience. David sings this song. Remember, he's been taking us through this place, this desert journey where God alone can get us the food and God alone can get us the water and God alone can find the path and God alone can take us through the valley. And then he says these words, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's describing a banquet. These are the things that happened at a banquet. If you went over and went to, were invited to the king's palace for a banquet or to the, maybe for a great celebration at, at a family friend's or at some wealthy person's home, uh, the first thing you would do is you would walk into the banquet hall and there'd be food. The tables would be laden with food. Anybody who's ever seen pictures of Middle Eastern dinners knows that they don't just serve you like one of this and one of that, right? It's just stuff all over the place. And the courses just keep coming. Before you, however, before you sit down or recline at the table, your head is anointed with oil. And that would kind of freak most of us out. You can imagine somebody coming up with olive oil and you're thinking it's for the salad and it ends up you're the salad. But <laughs> back then, it was, they, they didn't have you know, showers and shampoos and all this sort of thing. And the, 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 uh, the hair would get dusty and dirty. And so this was a way of refreshing and it was just a way of being super blessed that you would have your head anointed with oil. Remember when Jesus was, was um, at the home of Simon, the Pharisee, and the woman came in and poured the perfume on his feet. And Jesus, after Simon complained about the woman, Jesus looked at Simon and said, well, you didn't pour oil on my head. That was something you could have done. That's what, that's what you do at a real banquet. But, but you were on the cheap today. You didn't go there. You weren't quite sure how to, how to welcome me. Well, God knows how to welcome you. You anoint my head with oil. You give me the royal treatment. Cups are filled to overflowing with the finest of wines. My cup overflows. What's that say? There's just more. God is giving more than I could possibly take in. And the banquet celebrates a secure relationship between the banqueter and the king. Now, this term, your goodness, these two terms, your goodness and your love that follow me, those, those terms, especially the term love, is the word, the Hebrew word chesed, which means covenant love. It doesn't just mean, oh, I have a warm spot for you or I'm in love with you. It means I have committed myself to you. I've committed myself to be faithful to you. And the hesed of God is the great, great love that put Jesus on the cross for you and me. It's the love that is translated in the New Testament, if you know some of the, the New Testament words by the word agape, God's covenant love. 
So when he says, surely your goodness and your love will follow me, what he means is, you'll never give up on me. You'll never divorce me. You'll never disown me. You'll never break our relationship. You'll be faithful to me. This banquet is a celebration of our, of our covenant together. You know, the first thing we do after a, a husband and a wife commit their lives to each other and say their vows and promise that kind of covenant love, what's the first thing we do? We all go charging out of the church as fast as we can to go to the banquet. And in a way, that's what's happening here. He's saying this is a covenant banquet where God is pouring out His love upon us. And He says, I can't escape this. It pursues me. His love chases me down. How many of you have ever been chased down by God's love? There's every situation where He, he keeps coming. And even when we're not looking for Him, He keeps coming. Because he knows, how many of you ever chase somebody down because you love them? Ah. How many of you mothers actually do have 20-20 vision out of the back of your head? I know one that does. I know. It, she has spies. That's what she has. And intuition, right? We care about somebody. We look for them. If they're down and they're pulled away, if your child is kind of like having a hard day and feels like nobody loves me, everybody hates me, guess I have to eat worms, and they're sitting there, do you leave them there? Do you serve them a bag of night crawlers? What do you do? You go find them. What does a shepherd do when a sheep is lost? You go find them. You pursue them with your goodness and your love. Now, is it because you like the little stinker right then? Maybe not, but you love them. Is it because you approve of everything that that child did or that teenager said? Not necessarily. But you pursue them because you're in this for something bigger than how you feel for the moment. Well, God does that for you and me. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is not just a banquet that we are awaiting in the future. Everybody has dreams of food in the desert. Everybody dreams of water in the desert. Read the stories of people who have been marooned at sea or out on a raft or who have been caught in the, in the wilderness somewhere or have been out in a desert wandering around for days and days. What's the one? They can think about food. They can see a banquet. They just can't eat it. They can taste the water in their mind, but their throat is still dry. David says, not when the Lord is my shepherd. No. He fills us now. And that's just hors d'oeuvres for what he's going to do in the future. As Paul could write, in a prison cell, think about the hardship, think about the desert experience it was for Paul, the traveler, Paul, the, the preacher, the apostle, to be sitting with chains on in a desert cell. He's writing to the Christians in Philippi in four, chapter 419, Philippians 419. He says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. So how do we make this happen in our lives? It's great to talk about it, maybe get, feel a little encouraged for a second, but what are you going to do when you get home and the next desert thing happens? You know, the next, the next uh, time of need breaks in on you. That loneliness comes back. Oh, that wondering if things will ever come together, that feeling comes upon you. How does it work? How do we make this our daily reality? It's fascinating to see how, how Israel came to see the reality of God's presence in the Exodus and in their own lives. In Isaiah 63, I want to read you just about four verses that recapture the Exodus story. But I want to, note, I want to point out to you something that's going on in them that make it possible for us to see how the Good Shepherd is right here with us right now. It begins with a question, because these were people who were having a desert experience and were thinking back to the good old days of the Exodus. And they say in verse 11b, where is he who brought them, Israel, through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them, who sent his glorious arm of power to be Moses' right hand? who divided the waters before them to gain for himself everlasting renown, who led them through the depths. Like a horse in open country, they did not stumble. Like cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. This is how you guided your people to make for yourself a glorious name. You can see the Exodus story. They go through the Red Sea and they go through the desert. 
Can you also see Psalm 23 in there about being given rest by the Spirit of the Lord? Right? He restores my soul. Uh, can you see there how, how the shepherd, how, the, how God is pictured as working alongside of Moses as the shepherd of his flock? But notice how it all happens. Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? You see, the presence of God, so beautifully and powerfully depicted by the cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night, these amazing images, you know, that make for great cinema even to this day. The presence of God, Isaiah is saying, was really the Holy Spirit. He set his Holy Spirit among them. And look down at verse 14. Like cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, when the first Christians stepped out to do their Exodus journey, they discovered that the same God that had brought Israel through the desert was now present in the form of whom? The Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered them and sent them on their way. Jesus was the Passover lamb for the new Exodus. His death and resurrection were the Red Sea. That's what the scripture tells us is as a remaking of the Exodus. But guess what happens after the X Sea, everybody? After the Red Sea, we're out there on our desert journey. We don't just arrive at the promised land. And that's why the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts. Our ladies that were up on the mountain uh, took time to experience, many of you, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to dis rediscover Him and let Him come and pursue you with God's goodness and God's love. And that is how we experience God's presence as our shepherd. If you really want to think of it this way, the good shepherd is, in fact, the Holy Spirit. That's how, that's how God makes himself known to you and me. That means that as you go through your life situation, whatever that desert thing is that you're going through, the one person you want to build a relationship with is the Holy Spirit. The one voice you want to be able to hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes into our lives when we place faith in Jesus and gives us the power to say, Daddy, to the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one who comforts us. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings God's Word to life in us. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's the one that says when we're getting off the path. You see, he's the shepherd. He is our real experience of the good shepherd. I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to pursue the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. Some of you had that experience up on the mountain just this past week. Don't let it just be for the mountain. But ask the Lord, in what way, Lord, do you want this to keep happening and get even more and more powerful in my life? as days go by? In what way do you want to help me walk this journey through your presence? You know, it's easy to look at the Exodus story and just think, okay, miracles happened then. God was in a giant cloud. Red Sea broke wide open. That doesn't happen in my life. I get up in the morning. I go to work. I come back. It's same old, same old, same old. And we don't see God doing all these mighty things. That's what these Israelites were saying. Where is he who did all the cool stuff? And the answer is, he's right here, the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And as with the other parts of the Lord's Prayer, this is an Exodus request. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. You know why? Because we're hungry. Because we don't have our daily bread. Because we don't have what we need. It's our new normal requires that God provide for needs in the desert. And just as God provided manna in the desert for Israel, he's going to provide those green pastures in the desert for us. But first, we must welcome his Holy Spirit into our lives and learn to hear his voice. When he's present, he reveals the good shepherd. That's how Jesus shows up for us. And when we follow the shepherd, we find we have everything we need. Being in a desert is never fun. 
Jesus said to follow him was to take the less traveled path. Remember, wide is the way, a very broad street for everybody else, but there's a narrow gate we go through. Because it's a, it's a, a choice to, to take a path of change and take a path of letting God remake us so that we don't fit this world the way everybody else does. We, we are being remade according to God's new creation. It's a desert journey. And for that desert journey, we need the good shepherd. And the good shepherd is the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to be hungry for him. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God right here for us. And I would encourage you, if you have some questions about these things, uh, this Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock, we're continuing with the Connect class, and we will be delving into whatever you want to and need to talk about in addition to some of the other activities we have. So I know in our Bible studies, uh, uh, Sue's and, and, um, and Lucy's and other ones that take place, these are good questions you can ask, and I want to encourage you in that growth. We need your spirit, Lord God. Let's bow our heads and ask that the girls come at this time to, to take us into a time of just enjoying God's presence, continuing to just worship him for a few more moments. And if you have a prayer need this morning, I ask our prayer people as we stand together, let's all stand up if we could. Our prayer people to take their places. Uh, some of us be in the back, some of us be in the front here. If your desert has you in a place or a loved one, or a friend, where you need the Good Shepherd, let's just make this a time of prayer during this time of worship. Father, open our hearts, even right now, to the presence of your Holy Spirit, who brings the reality of you, the Good Shepherd, into living color in our lives. In Jesus' name.